this guy going. You heard it. Okay, topic G and your SLOs that you're supposed to be familiar with. Uh, part of the quiz hit on A, a little bit on B, and then the rest of it pretty much hit under F in terms of uh, energy and generation. So that'll probably be for us Wednesday. So for today, I'm just gonna give you the basic introduction on what metabolism is, which most of you already have, especially from A and P. So first basic concept that pretty much all of you should take is that everything that is alive requires some sort of food, some sort of nutrient, um, something to grow and typically make more of themselves. So by definition in biochemistry and in uh, microbiology, we call that nutrient, right? And so that means any type of compound, any type of molecule, and even atoms that serve as a source for, again, to grow and to reproduce. And so this subject deals with literally the ability to process those nutrients, and we call that metabolism. So metabolism is usually known as the sum of all the chemical reactions that are occurring inside any living thing, as opposed to what most people assume that it's just what you do when you eat even though it's kind of related, it's not really a direct uh, definition. Now, when we talk about metabolism, we usually hear about two types of reactions that occur, the ones that are usually taking in energy for them to work, and the ones that are releasing energy for them to uh, process something. Now, the issue with the ones we want, we want the exothermic ones, the ones that release energy so we can use it. The problem with that is that they take forever. And the reason behind that is because any type of reaction typically involves the conversion from a starting point or an ending point or what we call reactants into products. And if we let that happen on its own, it pretty much takes in the order of thousands and thousands of years for, for it to do so. And the reason why behind this is because of this fancy little term that I assume some of you have heard before called activation energy. So this should haunt you back to your gen chem days, right? What activation energy really meant is that it's the conversion from one state to another, reactants into products, that really what it's doing is destroying old bonds and, break, and making new ones. And so that takes quite a bit of time. As a matter of fact, massive amounts of time. And so this is just not enough for us to survive in. Clearly we don't live a thousand years, at least not yet. So it takes forever for this to happen. So what we need is another term that you probably remember from GCHEM called a catalyst. Catalysts as you probably all remember, are things that speed up reactions. And what they actually are really doing is lowering the activation energy that takes for those breaking and making new bonds. And so um, one key feature of our catalysts is that they're supposed to be uh, recyclable. You can uh, use them and use them and use them without having to uh, generate new ones. And so using these catalysts, lower that activation energy and allow uh, pretty much these reactions occur within our lifetime. Not a thousand years, not a hundred years, but usually in the milliseconds, the nanosecond uh, time frame. So when we look at this a little bit better, normally how we show this conversion from reactants into products is this curve, right? In which in the middle of it, there's this hump, this little big giant uh, wave that you're seeing up there that requires a huge investment of energy. And so that's what we call activation energy. What we want to do is add a substance, a compound, a chemical, whatever, in this case that we call a catalyst, that its job will be to make that little wave, that little mountain, a much smaller uh, hoop to jump. And so the catalyst shortens or lessens or lowers that activation energy, making it smaller, making it easier to proceed into the next step. An easier kind of metaphor, if you will, is by trying to somebody, somebody to work from point A to point B, which is what you're seeing on the screen right now. And the idea behind it is the higher the uh, little mountain that we're looking over there, the hill, the more difficult it is to work with. So the idea would be to lower, to flatten out that specific uh, hill to make the work much easier. And so that's what catalysts do. They lower that activation energy to make it easier to transition from point A to point B. And for us, that means in, in microbiology to convert from a nutrient to some sort of source of energy. That makes it an exothermic reaction. So for us, our proteins happen to be our catalysts. And so in our wonderful little world, they are the ones that lower the activation energy. 
and we have a fancy name for them called enzymes. So anytime you've heard the term enzyme, what it means is that some sort of protein that is able to convert the reactant into a product, typically for some sort of uh, chain reaction or production of energy. Now, not all proteins are enzymes and not all enzymes are proteins, but the greater majority, about 99% of all enzymes are composed of some sort of protein in the long run. So it's a pretty good assumption uh, to make sure that your proteins, uh, your enzymes are proteins. And so back to the central dogma as a quick reminder, remember that our proteins, therefore our enzymes, are encoded in our DNA, which means that they're part of our genome. And since most of these guys are part of our, our genome, depending on how we translate, transcribe, and so on and so forth, produce these guys, we'll get different effects. So the more enzymes you produce, the faster you can do things, the less enzymes you produce, so on and so forth. So that means that our DNA dictates how well our enzymes work, and that means that our DNA dictates how well our metabolism really works. So our proteins ultimately are gonna give us our enzymes. And don't forget that when we did the cell lecture, we talked about these uh, organelles that can actually modify them by adding little uh, sugars onto our proteins, little um, pieces of carbohydrates to them to modify them, to tag them, and to shift them to where they go. So this is a fairly well-involved process. Now, depending on which uh, piece you read from your textbook, I'm kind of taking a little piece from your textbook up there, um, not everything just releases uh, flat out energy. Sometimes you'll see things like heat. Obviously you can see gas production. Uh, you can see conversions from one state to another and so on and so forth. And this is the kind of stuff you did in Gen Chem, possibly in OCHEM too. For us, we are going to continue to do that in our labs 19, 19 through 38. We're looking at these type of reactions. So as opposed to just seeing energy release, we'll see something change in color, we'll see something change in state, we'll see something go from you know, one position to another, something live, something die, something consuming a nutrient and making another product. That's really what we're doing in the lab as well. So to kind of give you a quick uh, review, kind of a summary of this, remember that all enzymes, since they're proteins, or mostly proteins, they also work through their 3D shape. Meaning that again, this concept of denaturation is a big deal. So if you denature your enzymes, they stop being able to do what they're supposed to be doing. So since our enzymes are proteins, how do they actually perform this task? And so what we learn, again, from good old Gen Chem 2, is that our enzymes, our catalysts, have a special little location within them that causes this change of reactions. So when they convert from nutrient to product and release sometimes energy. And so that pocket is referred to as an active site, a pretty much a location, a hole, if you will, in which the substrate, the reactant, the nutrient goes in there and gets converted, gets acted upon. And so our nutrients and good old chemistry terminology, we call those substrates. And so those are our official reactants. They fit into that active site. And so as a silly little kind of image reference, I'm kind of showing you what a molecular model would be of an enzyme, which you're seeing there in kind of white, bluish colors. And then you can see there with the little arrow, that little pocket. And so within that pocket, that active site is where your nutrient should fit. That's where the food goes into, gets processed and ultimately releases some sort of product and converts it into energy. So a more kind of easier to visualize concept is you have an enzyme that we're highlighting here in green, right? And then that pocket that you're seeing being labeled as an active site, and then that nutrient can fit in there, that reactant can go in there, that substrate, and then that enzyme will act upon it, break it down, do something to it, convert it, whatever it is, add something to it, and then it'll give some sort of product, which is here what you're seeing into a little, uh, tiny little darker purple uh, piece, as well as a blue piece there. Now, if you guys recall from topic B, when we did our chemistry lecture, at the end when we were talking about reaction, we went through the very first set. And that first set, for those of you who remember, was something called hydrolysis. That meant that we took a polymer and then uh, forced the water into it and broke it down into smaller pieces, into its original monomers. That's hydrolysis. Enzymes can perform that particular task. But if you can go in reverse from the bottom in this case, and you take two pieces, put them inside the enzyme, the enzyme catalyzes it, takes two monomers and assembles it into a polymer. Now you get your dehydration uh, synthesis type of reaction. 
So all of the stuff we've been seeing so far is still kind of coming back and we're making it useful. Now for a moment, um, I'm gonna kind of trigger your memory to kind of remember how to do this in terms of good old AMP and possibly a little bit of Genco. And this has to do with how do we name things. And this is gonna be very useful when we do it in the uh, laboratory. So first of all, believe it or not, there's a very, very simple method on how to name our enzymes. And this is simply based on their ability of what they do, what are they doing it on, and then pretty much adding a little suffix at the end with a, the letters ASE or ACE. Okay, so <clears throat> let me give you a very simple system. For example, a substrate, a nutrient, a reactant like DNA. All right. And then what type of reaction we're going to cause. Okay. So in this case, we're going to polymerize it. We're going to make more of it. And so you'd add at the end the ASC. So the enzyme, the protein that does that, which you already know from the central dogma, is called DNA polymerase. You have that suffix at the end, right? You have the reaction that it performs to making more of it, make it larger, polymer, and then the substrate itself, DNA polymerase. Now we have different examples out there uh, that you can use. And so you'll see when we start talking about labs 19, 20, and so on and so forth, that there's all some sort of example of an enzyme that is doing that. For example, in labs 20 and 21, when we're looking at hydrolyses, we look at amylose and casein, which are probably the milk plates and the starch plates that we're using. In there, there's going to be an enzyme called casein hydrolase and another one called amylose hydrolase. Or they also usually kind of get um, uh, shortened into caseinase and amylase. That's really what we're doing. As long as you can remember that ASE, the process, and then what the sub substrate is, you can pretty much figure out what any enzyme really does. Now, our enzymes, in terms of our importance, is that not only biologically speaking, living in terms of living organisms, they perform all these uh, other tasks, but this has become part of our daily life in terms of industry. We utilize enzymes as a way to produce other things for us. So we have living conditions inside containers, if you will, inside factories that produce all our daily stuff. Anything from the fuel that we consume these days to probably the most infamous of them all, which I assume some of you guys can relate, is probably, uh, for those of you who happen to be lactose intolerant, uh, the removal of uh, lactose from milk. And so since a certain amount of population can't handle uh, high amounts of lactose in their diet, we can actually remove it. So what do we do is we actually have enzymes called lactases or lactose hydrolase that breaks down the lactose. And so what we do is we take milk, we pass it through a filter containing the enzyme, the enzyme breaks that down, and now the milk that comes out from the other side is lactose free. So your classic lactate and things like that, your little pills actually do that. Now, that being said, um, there are a version of these enzymes that kind of get little helpers. And so these are terms that we call cofactors or often be called coenzymes. And so what we have here are other molecules that support this ability of the enzymes to speed up reactions. And they do it by sometimes kind of bringing in the nutrients themselves or removing them from the active site or simply kind of speeding things up a little bit more. Now, what's unique about cofactors and coenzymes is that they cannot be made by the host itself. That's one of the key definitions. In other words, they have to be consumed. Cofactors and coenzymes have to be eaten, if you will. Okay, And so these are probably what most of you were reminded um, as children, as eat your veggies kind of thing, is that these are the ones you have to consume from some sort of uh, fruit or vegetable most of the time. So you can obtain these cofactors and coenzymes so that you can perform your regular reactions. Without these, you don't perform as well. And that's the concept of malnutrition. Now, in the same way that uh, enzymes are uh, recyclable, so are coenzymes. They are not used up. You can continuously use them and use them unless yeah, you get rid of them. All right, so let me pause there for a second. Thank you for that reminder. Okay, so now let's kind of deal with those both enzymes and coenzymes and kind of see them in their glory, 
right? So just like, again, we've reminded you from the general chemistry as well as the uh, cell lecture, is remember your enzymes are subject to their environments. Again, this whole idea behind denaturation. So how we usually analyze enzymes is based on how much they can produce. Just like any factory, just like any business, we're interested in how well it can work. And so we have our first term that we, that we use here is called turnover number, which pretty much tells us how much can it produce, okay? So the total number of reactants or substrates that it can actually convert or uh, affect in overall. And then we have a second one that's called turnover rate, which means how much of that can it do typically in some sort of amount of time, usually in this case, uh, in the 60 second kind of range or per minute, okay? So um, what is really cool about enzymes is again, they speed up things rather than taking a thousand, 10,000 years or whatever this may be, they speed it up in the order of a thousand times to up to billions and trillions of times faster. And so you take the notion of time, if something takes 10,000 years, and you speed it up a thousand times, that's still a year. So you're speeding up a million times, now you're down to a third of a day and so on and so forth. So speeding it up billions and trillions of times makes it happen in our lifetime. Okay, so that's why this is important for us. Now, where we're gonna go with this is what type of things in the environment can affect them. First of all, we wanna make sure that our enzymes, our business is working top notch, right? So we wanna optimize it. And so we call that condition an optima, right? Plural for optimum. And so we're looking at it in terms of temperature. We're gonna look at it in terms of pH. And in a very kind of indirect way, we're gonna look at concentration. How does concentration affect um, how an enzyme more or less is produced or how much does it produce in the long run? So the first one is probably gonna be the easiest one to kind of relate to. In this case, since we've already dealt with temperature, is that there is a temperature at which the enzyme performs its best, its peak, its top notch. And remember that temperature is based on motion, that moving things around. So here the idea is important in terms of temperature simply because the faster certain things move, technically the faster you can make certain products occur, right? However, there is a limit to this because you can have an optimum temperature, but also what happens if if the actual uh, speed of these reactants and these enzymes goes beyond or goes too far, kind of like a fever, remember? So if the temperature is lower than the optimum where you want it, our reactions themselves will stop, will slow down enough. This is the same idea of why we put things in the fridge. We're cooling things down, meaning we're slowing molecular motion, and so therefore the reactants and the enzymes don't quite meet as fast, and therefore they don't perform as fast. And so this is something we've been exploiting for quite some time since we discovered even just ice, right? But um, what happens if the temperature is higher than the optimum? Things speed up too much. So now we're increasing collisions, we're increasing, increasing uh, the encounters behind them and things start to get hot, warm, remember? And so the issue here is that just like in terms of fevers, these will break down our proteins, they will denature them, will unfold them, will lose their three-dimensional structure and stop working completely. So it's kind of important to have this kind of perfect balance, this kind of Goldilocks stage that we talk about a lot. And so uh, for us, this is pretty much our best aim. Anybody wanna kind of chime in on what's typically our optimum temperature? We've done this in the lab already and we did this in the cell lecture. No, help me out here. What's the best temperature to grow things for us? I know some of you guys. Seven degrees Celsius. What was that again? I heard. Thirty-seven Celsius. There we 37. go. Thirty-seven. And what does this turn into in Fahrenheit? Ninety-eight point six. Ninety-eight point six. Ninety-eight point seven is perfect. So remember when we're doing this in the lab, same idea. The conditions in which we're growing all these bacteria is thirty-seven degrees Celsius. Our incubators are set to that temperature. So our optimum temperature for most of us, mind you, not everything, is that 37. Now there is a pH for that too. There is an optimum pH. I'm reminding you that um, in this case, the best pH that we're looking for, and pH is all about those hydrogens, those uh, protons floating around, that electricity floating around. And so this also influences the sh uh, shape of the 
protein or the enzyme simply by charge, by electricity. You're kind of shocking the protein if it's too high or too low. So pretty much the same thing that happens is that we have an optimum pH and for us it's roughly around seven, it's not perfectly seven, okay? Um, and the idea is that things are too acidic. Uh, in this case, we have high amounts of these protons, high amounts of these hydrogen ions, which kind of clog into the site, kind of literally shock things and break the protein down and prevent it from working. And so this will uh, prevent the actual protein from working. But it also happens if it's too alkaline. So if it goes too basic, in other words, you lower the amount of protons present by too much, now you're reducing the charge available for those particular enzymes and their reactants, and the same concept happens. The enzyme stops working. Now, just understand that, again, most things kind of happen to live into this pH 7, roughly speaking, but there's plenty of exceptions out there. So don't forget that, um, for example, things like your stomach happens to work perfectly happy at pH of between 0 and 3, and things like your liver, which apparently some of you guys like to challenge every now and then by adding massive amounts of alcohol, it likes to live in a pH of 9 to 10. And by adding things that are, in this case, alcoholic, and this includes soda, for example, um, you will challenge that pH, making it work uh, less efficiently, if you will. All right. Now, there's one last one we talked about. We talked about temperature. We talked about um, pH. And we did mention the concentration also made an effect. So we're going to discuss this for now, and then we'll probably end up for this for the next uh, chapter. All right. So first of all, we want to talk about more or less what happens at that active site, what enters in that little pocket where the reactant is supposed to go. In other words, you're occupying the enzyme. Now, interestingly enough, we know that we have multiple versions of enzymes that can do similar types of jobs. In other words, more than one enzyme can exist that does the same type of process. Now, what's the idea behind this? Well, one of the best uh, advantages behind this is the fact that if you can have multiple enzymes, you can have some as backups. So when one breaks down, you still have another one to do that same job. Or alternatively, you can have ones that work under different conditions. So when one is too cold or one is too hot or one is too acidic and so on and so forth, you already have another one that can serve you as a backup, okay? So having multiple versions of these is kind of useful. Now, as that being mentioned, we wanna kind of discuss how does concentration truly affect that uh, particular occupation of that enzyme? And so remember, we want to control the rate. We want it to have at the most optimal amount of production, the conversion from reactant into product and extraction of energy. And so here we enter some of those properties of life that we talked about way, way at the beginning of the topic. And so these are called control processes. And we talk about two key ones called coordination and regulation. And really what these mean are the ability to have something coordinated in terms of time and regulated in terms of amount. And if we can do both of those, we achieve a state that you all know as homeostasis. So let's enter the first one. The first one is coordination, which means that you are producing the correct enzymes at the right time when it's properly needed. But this also involves in the right order. In other words, you're not producing things out of order that again, become wasteful. An example that I can always give, and we will talk about this a little bit later, is the subject of uh, breaking down glucose for energy. Again, subject that we're going to be studying in the lab a lot. Now, typically, in the most basic set of reactions for breaking down glucose, we employ six different enzymes, or six different steps, I should say, to break down glucose to extract, extract a little bit of energy from it. Now, there, that means there's six different steps. So step one, two, and so on and so forth. What happens if one of those enzymes is missing? And I don't mean necessarily just gone for that particular step, but what about in time or in order? So if you have steps one through six and step five is missing, what's gonna happen? So you're not gonna be able to make your final product. Or if you have them, but not in the right amounts are needed, we'll talk about that in regulation, also a problem. So you need your enzymes to be always produced when you need them, and also in the correct sequence or order behind them. Now, how we control this is based on how much reactant do you have? In other words, how much nutrient do you have? And this is kind of almost becomes obvious once you think about it in terms of everyday life. What happens, for example, if what you need, your nutrient isn't available very often, if it's not present all the time? 
Well, it's no, there's no point behind your cell, you as an organism, to start making enzymes if the actual food is not there, okay? And so this is again, a timing type of situation. So uh, the biggest example that I usually give my students is based on everyday life. Not that it applies very much right now, but think about any, any time you're actually hungry. So whenever you're hungry, usually you get a signal to your brain, your stomach, uh, your intestines start sending signals to your brain telling you, hey, you need to eat, you need some nutrients. And then you consume something. Now, the idea is there's a right time for this, whether it's your breakfast, lunch, dinner, second breakfast, 11 days, whatever you want to call it, right? There is a time for it. But what happens when you eat outside of that temp time frame? Well, when you consume something, when you're not supposed to be needing those nutrients or you don't need them at that time, now you're just putting all this nutrients in there to waste and there's nothing to process them. I assume that most of you at some point in time, possibly currently, have gone to the fridge just for the sake of going to the fridge, even though you weren't really hungry. Now, the problem with that is that you're consuming this massive amount of nutrients, but your stomach is not ready for it. Your intestines are not ready for it. So all these enzymes that are supposed to be there when you need them are not. And so this will cause an effect down, uh, down the line. So as opposed to the other timing around this is what happens when you're starving and there is no substrate available for you. In other words, no food. So at this point in time, you wasted the production of all these enzymes and there's nothing to consume. So coordinating the, the actual uh, timing in terms of when you need these enzymes is actually quite critical. Now combo this with regulation, which this idea is the amount of how much you're supposed to produce also influences how fast things can work. And so this is about, again, concentration. How much stuff do you have out there? And so what happens if you have the right food, you have the right enzymes, you have the right timing, but you don't have the right amount, the right quantity of them to do the right job, okay? So here's a kind of another critical example. In terms of regulating your enzymes, it's all about how much is available. So if your substrate, your reactant, your food, your nutrient, is present in high amounts, well then you can make lots of enzymes for it. It doesn't go to waste. However, if the substrate is not available all the time, so it's available in smaller amounts, then you don't really need that much enzyme to begin with. And so this is again, a concentration solution. In other words, you solve it based on the amount. Now, another way to kind of achieve this, I can give you a different uh, example behind this is every single time you've gone to the store, possibly even now, in this case in which you will go to the store and there's 500 customers, but then there's only one cashier open. There's an issue of concentration again, all right? Or opposite to that, probably the most annoying one of them all, is you can have 20 cashiers and only one customer available. So there's a problem with regulation. In business world, we call that management, right? The right boss should know when to have the right people available for the right amounts. Well, the body does exactly that. It regulates the right amount of enzyme and the right amount uh, when the right amount of substrate is available. So if you can put those two things together, you achieve a state of homeostasis. You can achieve both coordinating and regulating the timing and the amount of enzymes that you need to have a proper uh, homeostatic state of nutrients converting them into products. Now, when those don't quite work very well, there's a catch-up method behind this. Here, there are ways to kind of adjust to the amount of stuff you need. And so we call these slow and fast methods of control. The slow version of this, we call these uh, control mechanisms messengers, signals, if you will. And these are usually uh, small uh, little molecules that we can either call them repressors or activators, just so you know, that either turn up or turn down, in other words, increase or reduce the amount of enzymes. And so when you need them, these guys can turn them on so you can have the amount you need. Or when you don't, the opposite state, you can reduce them and get rid of them when you don't. Again, management, this idea of controlling or regulating how much you need, okay? So repressors uh, turn down the amount of enzymes that you can produce and activators turn them up. Now, the problem with this is that these are slow methods. The problem with this is that in this case is that it takes forever to do so. I assume that some of you at some point in time were called into work even though it was your day off. It 
takes a while for somebody to get phoned and say, hey, we, we're kind of behind, we need some more people to come and work for us, and somebody to get there to get to work, right? Same premise, these are slow versions of that communication. However, there are faster methods, and these fast methods um, are on the spot, as its name implies. And so the most uh, common example of this is called inhibition or enzyme inhibition, in which we have molecules that work really, really fast at stopping the enzyme from doing its job. So rather than waiting for hours and hours for it to work, these occur right on the spot. And so what we're gonna do next Wednesday is we'll talk about which types of inhibition exist. And so there's gonna give you a few examples of product inhibition, competitive inhibition, allosteric inhibition, which has a little bit of a side uh, halfway inhibition called feedback inhibition. And so all three of these, or three and a half versions of these, if you will, are quick ways of controlling your enzymes, turning them off most of the time, but also on in the long run. So what we wanna do with this is uh, observe how fast or how slow we can control our enzymes. And then once we're done covering with that set of examples, we'll enter our process of metabolism. In other words, we'll start seeing the actual reactions that generate our energy. So for now, we'll actually stop here.